Good morning, church. Praise God for another day. I'm so happy to be with you this Wednesday morning for another devotional, another Living Hope Today. Thank God for you. I'm so happy we're together again to study God's Word. I'm still battling that chest cold, but as you can tell, things are making improvement. Thank you again for praying and for uh, your support while I sound like I'm talking like uh, there's a frog in my chest. But um, by the grace of God, we'll continue to improve. Don't forget to pray. (laughs) We'll do our best today to learn some more about how Jesus trains us to be his disciples. In fact, That's right where we're going to start again. We're looking at the foundations of discipleship. And specifically, we're trying to answer this question. How does Jesus train his disciples? Now, we talked about this. He teaches them. He's in relationship with them. And he tells them to go out and practice what he's taught them. They need to live in obedience to what he's commanded. All right, so we're focusing first on his teaching because... This is exactly where he begins. In Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount comes for three chapters. It's one of his most famous, if not the most famous, sermon Jesus ever preached. And it really lays out the fundamentals of his kingdom and the principles that he wants us to live by. Maybe you'll remember briefly, if you want to really be happy, if you want to really be blessed, the people that have true contentment and and know their in peaceful in a peaceful place with the Lord. Well, those are the people that are poor in spirit. Those are the people that are mourning over their sin. The truly happier, blessed people are the meek people, the people that are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the people that are merciful, the people that are pure in heart, the people that are peacemakers. These are the things that Jesus emphasizes that he wants his people, his kingdom people, to be like. But today, he takes us to a place that might really shock you. I know it shocks most of us when we see it. He says in this Beatitude in 510, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Persecuted. I mean, You're happy. You're truly happy. You're blessed. You have peace when other people are trying to hurt you and stop you. Uh, They might not be just trying to. They might really be hurting you and stopping you and slandering you. And Jesus says that's where happiness is. If that's happening for righteousness sake, that's where happiness is. Now, we're going to start at the back end of this. Watch this. In the first beatitude in 5.3, Jesus says you're blessed if you're poor in spirit. Remember we talked about that. If you have a poverty of heart and mind, you understand you're bankrupt before God. You need his salvation. You have nothing in and of yourself to present to God to make yourself acceptable to God. You're poor in spirit. If that's you, then yours right now in present time is the kingdom of heaven. Now watch this in Matthew 5.10, the one we're looking at today. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you see that the result of both Beatitudes is the same thing? Now think about this. If you mourn, you will be comforted. If you're meek, you will inherit the earth. If you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be satisfied. If you're merciful, you will receive mercy. If you're pure in heart, you will see God. If you're a peacemaker, you will be called the child of God. But if you're persecuted for righteousness sake, the kingdom of heaven is yours now. That's the message God brings to us. That the kingdom of heaven is ours now when we understand our poverty of spirit The kingdom of heaven is ours now if we're persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, why are people so persecuted if they're following God, loving Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, doing what God has called us to do? Why does the world want to attack that? What is it? Well, Jesus goes into a pretty lengthy explanation. I think we'll take a minute and look at it. It's in John 15. He says, look. You guys, if the world hates you, 
Here's what you got to know about it. Know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. In other words, if you did what everybody else does, you would fit in. There wouldn't be any problem, but you belong to me. See, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. In other words, you have moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And now that you're mine, they hated me, they're going to hate you. Therefore, the world hates you. And he goes on, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Just notice that, that the people that hate God, the people that want to stop the truth of the gospel, they hated Jesus, they're going to hate us too. But if we present the gospel to people who have God's heart and are willing to open their mind to the truth, well, some responded to Jesus by coming to him by faith, and some will respond to you and me when we present the gospel. Who Who's going to respond? Well, we don't know. That's God's business. Our job is to let our light shine. 21, but all these things they will do to you on account of my name. And here's why. Here's why persecution comes. Because they do not know him who sent me. We're persecuted by people because they don't know God. And Jesus goes deeper into this. Watch this. If I had not come and spoken to them, in other words, I told them the truth, they would not have been guilty of sin. What does that mean? Jesus is telling us, look, I told them the truth. I told them about who God is, what he requires, how he hates evil, how they're evil, how they're objects of wrath, how they need to repent and come to me by faith. I told them the truth. If I didn't tell them, they wouldn't be guilty. But now... They have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. Wow, and just stop there for a second. Think about all the people that reject Jesus but say they love God. Well, that is not the case. Jesus clearly declares that if you hate Jesus, you hate God. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. Okay, watch. 22, I gave them the teaching. I told them the truth. 24, I did what only God can do before them. They saw it with their own eyes. I confirmed what I taught them with what I did. If I hadn't done what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now... They have seen and hated both me and my father. This is why people hate Christians who continually talk about who Jesus is, how salvation works, how the wrath of God is coming and the judgment of God is coming, and those who will escape are the ones who escape through faith in Jesus Christ. The only name by which we must be saved. People don't want to be told they're wrong. People hate it when they're told that there is only one way. And that's exactly what Jesus continued to confront his culture with day in and day out. So we come back to today's beatitude. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Look at that. For righteousness sake. There's a qualifier on here. It's for righteousness sake. What does that mean to you and me? Well, one thing it means so simply is don't be persecuted because you're a jerk. God's not ever calling us to be rude to people or to be uh, ugly. I mean, we're called to present the truth to people in love. If you're persecuted because you are living as God has called you to live, if you're persecuted because you're doing... Uh, evangelism, you're speaking to people, you're telling them about who Jesus is, you're warning them of his wrath to come. If that's why somebody's attacking you, then you are being persecuted 
for righteousness sake. And Jesus makes the promise to those who experience persecution under those terms. So don't think because somebody hates you because you're uh, always trying to jam Jesus down their throats and, and they just won't respond. Jesus never calls us to be rude. He never calls us to be um, uh, in any way abrasive. He calls us to tell the truth in love. What's the most loving thing you can do to somebody who's destined to hell? You can tell them that through Christ they can be saved. They might not like to hear it. They may react as we've spoken of. But the most loving thing you can do in, in gentleness, in meekness, as, as you experience your own mourning over your own sin and your own poverty of spirit, you go to that person and you tell them that if they don't come to Jesus Christ, the Word of God guarantees that they'll be separated from God forever. Look at this in John 3. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. That's Jesus. He is the light. And people loved the darkness rather than the light. Okay, so people would rather live in their sin. Why? Because their works were evil. Do you see that? In other words, everyone that hasn't come to Jesus Christ still has that sinful nature working in their hearts and minds in full power. They don't want to come into the light. They don't want to be confronted. Look at verse 20. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. We're, we're back to that poverty of spirit idea. We're, we're back to the idea that... <clears throat> If you're not willing to say, I'm wrong before God, you're not savable, if that's a word. I don't know if it is. But hey, God says, look, if you want to start, if you want to experience my happiness, my blessedness, become poor in spirit, admit your guilt, mourn over your sin. That's where we begin. The world says, I'm not coming into the light. You can't tell me I'm wrong. Who do you think you are? It's a question you'll encounter as you witness to your neighbors and friends. Many of you probably already have. I could tell you some stories, but we don't really have time this morning. The point is simple, though. If you present the gospel in love to people who are in darkness, they will sometimes respond by faith, and they will sometimes respond by antagonism, by persecution. Second Timothy, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We see this in Paul's life. If you look at these verses, I didn't write them all out, but if you read 1 Corinthians 4, 8 through 13, you'll see that Paul says, I'm following Christ and what's happening to me? Well, they're calling me a fool. They're attacking my reputation. They think I'm weak. My physical needs are not being met. I'm homeless. I'm reviled. I'm slandered. They're saying all kinds of things about me that aren't true. He says, we have become the scum of the earth. And, and you think, man, that's terrible. Who would want to do that? You know, God, don't call me to that. I just want to live a happy life. And God says, look, if you're going to really be mine, if you're going to talk the truth to the people in your life, you're going to experience some of these things. Paul, after he lists all these things that are happening to him and that are so hard on him, what does he say? Does he say, but you don't have to go through that? No, he says, I urge you then be imitators of me. Be like me. Don't worry about the fact that they're going to hate you or say bad things about you or do mean things to you. It's a, it's a badge of honor before God to be persecuted. You know you're living in the kingdom of of God now because people can see that you're different. People can understand that you're following the truth. And that evil heart, that sinful nature within them rebels. No, I will never do it. A little side note. A great question for somebody when you're witnessing is just this. Hey, if Christianity is true, would you become a Christian? There's a lot of people out there that would say, I don't care if you prove it to me. I will never bow my knee to Jesus Christ. Why? It's that sinful nature. It's that desire to live for self. That same thing Adam and Eve did. I know God told me not to eat of that, but I want to, so I'm going to. It's in those moments 
that that sinful nature rises up, that people say it doesn't matter if it's true or not. I won't come to Christ. You can't help a person like that. You can pray for them. That's it. James says, look, when things like this happen, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Understand this, church, that persecution comes, yes, but God has a purpose in persecution as well. It's not just to see people do mean things to you. It helps us grow. We mature. We get, we get closer to Christ as we experience suffering. In one twelve, James says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. What does that mean? No matter what they do to you, keep believing. Walk with Jesus. Serve him. Love your enemies. Look what happens. For when he has stood the test... He will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Ah, there it is. To really understand how to walk through persecution, we have to be able to have that future outlook. To look at the fact that this isn't all there is. These 60 or 70 or 80 years we have on this earth, this is just a fraction, a minuscule thimble full of time compared to eternity in the presence of God. Whatever we go through here to serve him is, is inconsequential. Paul calls his troubles light and momentary. We don't have to focus on having our best life now. We have to say to God, I want to serve you in every way possible. Help me be a witness, a light. Help me show others the way. Open my mouth. Let my behavior be so godly that people will understand the reality of who Jesus is. And when that happens, some people will come into the kingdom. God will bear fruit through you. But some people will say, never. And they will hate you for it. And they will attack you for it. Okay, so that happens. How do we get through it? Well, in Hebrews we're told this. Consider him who endured from sinners such a hostility against himself. What do we do? We think about Jesus. Whatever they do to us, we still haven't been crucified, at least most of us. I think if you look up the statistics these days, you'll see that Christians all over the world are giving their very lives so that they don't forsake Jesus. Uh, you know, ISIS is telling people all over the world, look, if you don't renounce Jesus, we're going to cut your head off. And the people say, well, I can never renounce the Lord of glory. Go ahead, cut my head off. I'd rather die a martyr than betray Jesus, the one who I love. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. He gave his life for us. He knows all about our life. Look, he doesn't want us to grow weary or faint-hearted. He doesn't want us to give up because it's just too much to ask. No, he wants us to stand for the truth in the power of his Spirit, regardless of what circumstance comes our way, regardless of what people might do to us. And what's the promise? Well, you're going to be a happy person, a blessed person, if you suffer persecution while living a godly life. Knowing the future. What is the future? The kingdom of God will be ours for eternity. But even in our suffering now, the kingdom of God is ours today. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Oh, church. Are we authentic enough in our behavior and in our life to be blessed by being persecuted? I pray that we are. I pray that we make such an impact with the love of Christ in our daily lives that people react. They react either by coming to Christ or they react through their attack. However they are, react, God continues to confront the heart of the sinner saying, come to me. I don't want anyone to perish. I died for the sins of the world. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. There's no condemnation for any who are in him. I hope you got something out of that this morning. Please leave your comments or questions below. Tomorrow, God willing, we will learn as Jesus repeats this same idea about persecution. Uh, there's links below. 
Uh, if you want to learn more about Living Hope Community Church or the ministries we offer to help you grow as a disciple or for prayer, you can check those out. <clears throat> I just trust today that if you're in a situation where you're persecuted, that you learn how to rejoice, that you learn how to count it as a badge of honor, that God would count your life so much His that even though your parents have rejected you or your spouse has rejected you or you've been fired from your job or or there's been some sort of physical attack or you've been slandered and lied about, whatever God might be doing in your life through this persecution, I just trust that you grow in Him and understand that this isn't strange, this isn't odd. When people attack, it's a sign that you're living your life authentically before God. God bless you today. I hope this Wednesday is a great day for you. God willing, we'll be back together again tomorrow at 7 to continue our exploration of how Jesus taught his disciples to become the people he's called them to be. I pray that you serve him well today, and God bless you. Lord, we give you glory. We give you honor.